Hello, welcome to another Focus Friday brought to you by Mapex and Majestic. My name is John Harville and it's great to be here. And as you can see, we are not at my home office or kitchen anymore. We are actually back at KHS America. Uh, this week, we're practicing all the, the safety guidelines, social distancing, we're staying uh, very clean, very sanitary, but man, it is great to be back here uh, and to see uh, so many of the wonderful faces that we've missed over the past couple of months. Um, before we get to our next guest, got a couple things. Make sure that you guys are checking out the Stay at Home, Learn at Home, Play at Home initiative campaign, specifically with marching drums, right? It's never been more affordable and easier to bring home your own marching snare or set of tenors now, right? As that information is now getting out, should be able to take advantage of it so if you do want to get a very cool snare of your own or a set of quads on your own now's a great time to take advantage of that i also want to go ahead next focus friday next week we're going to be talking to ralph nader and harvey thompson you probably know them as bios those guys are always just a ton of fun very entertaining very educational and we have a lot of stuff coming down the pipe with those guys, so you want to check that out. What launched this past week, uh, Playing at Home with Dave Natal. If you checked out our video with our Focus Friday with Dave a couple weeks ago, you know that he's just a super positive guy, and he's going to be breaking down a series of five to eight different video series, working on your chops, working on different things, um, a greater understanding of... Uh, rudiments and how to apply them but he does it in such a fun and positive way and we encourage you to get your sticks out play along with Dave now I'm really excited uh, in honor of this Memorial Day weekend to have our next guest he's the sergeant major of the old guard drum and fife corps in Washington DC he's an encyclopedia of drumming in history, not just from the US, but all around the world. So he's gonna just get a little bit of how we got to this point, and it's awesome to have him here. Mr. Mark Riley, I'm so happy you're here. How you doing, Mark? I'm well, how are you doing today? Very good, very glad to be here and uh, talking to you. And uh, look forward to um, not only myself, but uh, couple other, you know, all of our viewers probably learning a new point of view on some rudimental percussion. Excellent. No, I mean, it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, I feel really blessed to have had the background that I've had with the mentors and instructors who have looked out for me over the years. And, you know, so one of the things that I'll start off with is my dear instructor, Nick Antanasio, uh, started drumming in 1932. And he taught me since I was the age of 11 and he passed away about a year and a half ago. Um, but his iconic lesson to me was the quote, this is not our art form to keep, it is only ours to give. So I've just tried to be a sponge and learn as much as I possibly can about the different traditions, the different techniques, the different stories, uh, and learn the generational stories between, you know, the classic drummers from the 1930s, 40s, 50s, who they taught, how that led into drum and bugle corps, how that led into the world of drumming that we have today. Right. And that's one of the things that I'm really looking forward to, to getting into because um, all of my, my buddies around here says, you know, it's not just hands, but it's the story behind the hands that you're going to get and you're going to learn the history of how we got to a certain place. So that's what I'm really looking forward to kind of digging into that for my own personal uh, knowledge. Um, so you had done a couple of, of um, interviews and I, it really caught my attention about kind of the historical context of which some of these rudiments uh, have come about and how they were utilized. Can you speak a little bit about how, you know, how the history kind of came about and how we write the way we do or did and how it's kind of changed a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, you can do a doctoral dissertation on every one of these chapters. So this is by by no means a, a, you know, full, you know, encyclopedia of exactly how it all happened. But this is kind of just a brief overview. Um, you've had you've had military drumming ever since there was war. Um, it was to strike fear in the hearts of the enemies. Uh, it was to keep soldiers disciplined. Uh, the role of the drummer has changed throughout throughout history. Um, and so 
So fast forward to something we can actually document. Uh, the first reference to rudiments is in the Arbo book uh, from 1585. And so the Arbo book actually has the drumming beats that were played to court dances. So it was a French book, it was French dancing, and it would have had, here are the rhythms that you would play on the drum in order to make this dance happen. And so if it was written in the, in the 1500s, you know that it had to have been happening before that for them to have written it down as a standardized procedure. So when we get to the idea of rudiments, we're looking at structure, we're looking at standardization, we're trying to look at education on how to pass on one technique or one style or one method from one generation to the next. And that's really the story of rudiments. Um, and so, I mean, this is one thing I love to share with, with my students as well, is that as soon as you pick up a pair of sticks, you're part of a story. Um, your teacher is showing you what they were shown. And so right there, that's your first toe in the water of a super in-depth, really historic and amazing story about drumming. Um, so to go back to this Arbo book, you start to look at what was happening during that time. And you had Swiss mercenaries that were uh, all over the place uh, being paid for by different kings and queens to fight for their crown. And so a lot of people will say, well, the rudiments really started in Switzerland, which in all technical, um, in all technical answers it did, uh, but it was heavily financed by the French. Um, so the French were the ones with the purse strings and they would pay the Swiss mercenaries. They would fight for King Louis XIV. And we start getting now this codification of how do we teach all of these troops to move in these specific ways? So if I was to play something like boom, 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 you know, eighth note, eighth note, quarter, right, right, left, that would have a certain meaning. And so that meaning then would signal to those people to go right or to go left. And it was something as simple as that. And so when we say, well, what are the real rudiments? It gets very hairy because then you have to ask the question, how far back into history do you really want to go? So the 26 standard American rudiments, and we fast forward to that, that was all really a basis of what was brought to the United States you know, during the colonial period. We end up breaking away from the English. The English had a system of the camp duty, but if you look into the camp duty, you have your seven stroke roll, your nine stroke roll, your flams, your paradiddles, things like that. But the names of the pieces of music that were inside of the camp duty were the Prussian, the Hessian, the Austrian, the slow scotch, the quick scotch. And those were all pieces of different, uh, different countries that had come over to the United States to settle. And that got wrapped up into our camp duty. So from the very beginning of the American rudimental story, we've already got this hybrid mix of where do we get our tradition from? And so there's an argument that goes into the 1820s, into the 1830s, 40s, 50s. You have the Hart book, you have the Bruce and Emmett book, which are these military manuals that come from the Ashworth book to start rectifying what is the American style. And so when you get to the American style in the 1860s, you start seeing things like a flamicue, which would never have been played in Europe because everything that was from this European tradition was very downbeat oriented, very clear for marching, very clear for understanding where the beats would fall. The flamicue having the accent on E was really the first kind of funky rudiment to offset the downbeat. So, there are lots of arguments. I'm not saying this is the exact, you know, here is the history behind it, but there are a lot of research. Uh, there's been a lot of research done that has gone back to the flamicue. So to fast forward that and wrap up this one little portion here, um, you can start looking into the Civil War books and that flamicue running into ragtime music, into jazz, into blues with kind of a swing feel with that flamicue. <laughs> That's more history probably that I've ever received about something <laughs> I've done for, you know, junior high on that. That's cool. So you talked a little bit, you talked about, um, you know, right, right, left and, the you know, signaling in the army, which way to go. So is it to say that there was times where maybe everybody had to learn, you know, sit there and watch this, you know, drummer and learn, yeah, this is what that is, because you can't, all right, we're going to just email them the audio file. And when you hear this in battle, you know, you'll know to do this. So 
So is there is there anything behind that, like where you know the poor little drummer boy is up there and you know having to show all these folks, all these you know, uh, you know what this is, so they know what it is in context. Right, right, right. Um, I think that even brings up an interesting discussion of who is is the lead drummer. You know, for years, we've been thinking the center snare. The center snare is the guy we listen to or the woman we listen to. And really, in the military, the person that would be listened to would be to the right-hand side of the formation because that was the point of honor. So if we start talking about, we'll get into styles a little bit, and I want to make sure we keep the fire hose turned to a, a minimum with this because there is, there is a lot of information to absorb. Um, the point to the, the point of honor was the point to the right. So even in a military formation now, uh, you're supposed to walk to the left of someone who outranks you. So the sergeant drummer or the lead drummer would actually be to the right of the formation. So, but this is also drum lines were not seven or nine snares. It would have been four or five snares. So you're not talking about that larger spread, which would kind of force you to have an actual true center snare. Um, but yeah, so I mean, through to, to answer your question, um, that's one of the things that you start looking at is moving right, right, left, and moving forward into someone having to teach that. You move into the idea of the printing press, you have all of these ideas here, and you start thinking about music history, and you start thinking of nooms, and how do you write this? And it wasn't until about the early 20th century that they came to an agreement on how to write the rudiments. Uh, because in the Hart book or the Bruce and Emmett book, there would have been a drum sergeant that would have had to show everybody and teach them all by rote. And so you really got a very in-depth understanding of how to play that rudiment from that teacher. And then there was a challenge because they would have a competition with the drummers that eventually led into what we have today. And the style from each instructor was, was a variable. And so they would say, well, no, the Flamacue has two accents. No, the Flamacue has three accents. No, the Flamacue has one accent. And if you went and you competed in a different circuit and the idea of that circuit was this drumming method, you would get disqualified because you, play, you played a Flamacue with three accents instead of one accent. And so that's when the idea of NARD came up in 1933 and they build the 26 standardized rudiments and they start going off of one method. That, well, first of all, I'm glad to know that when I was in high school and I wasn't in the middle, I was actually the point of honor because I was today, <laughs> I was on the end and to the right. So it turns out I was way ahead of my time before. Uh, so, man, I, I can already tell we're going to have to come back and just kind of you know, we're just going to scratch the surface on some of this stuff, but we'll have to come back and dig in. Sure, sure. You know, it, it's, it's something to hear that and, you know, to know that today's activity, you know, people are part of something that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, but we're, we typically probably only think, you know, like, well, you know, I started seeing drum corps in the 90s or the, you know, the 2000s, but it goes back a whole lot further than that. So right, I can already right, right. tell we're gonna have to <laughs> we're gonna have to dig in on some more of this. Um, I wanted to, uh, we've had a couple of guests on and we've talked about the you know you you do your you get up to the age of twenty one and then it's done and you, you you throw away this passion that you've already had for a long, for you know you've been building to your whole you know to adult life, um, but you've obviously made a. Uh, a career and a, a passion of it via some of these military music ensembles. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, like, uh, let's just talk about the audition process uh, of getting sure. into one. And uh, you should please tell us, you know, which um, ensemble and organization you're with. Sure. Um, so my day job is I'm actually the Sergeant Major for the U.S. Army Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps. And the official title for that is the 3rd U.S. Infantry Regiment, the Army's official uh, ceremonial unit and escort to the president. So we do the White House arrivals. Uh, we do all of the visits from the heads of state, uh, things of that nature. Our bread and butter mission is the inauguration every four years. Um, and then the unit that we're attached to, the unit that we're a 
part of also has the responsibility of Arlington National Cemetery. So the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, Arlington Cemetery with the gravestones, we're actually gonna go in there this afternoon uh, and do what we call as flags in, which is putting a, a American flag in front of each tombstone for our fallen uh, servicemen and women. So that's, that's my, my, my day job. Um, before I was the Sergeant Major, I was the drum group leader who led the percussion section. And then before that, I was the snare drum section leader and also a ranger for the core. Um, but the audition process has absolutely evolved, of course, with technology and over time. Uh, but there's still some bread and butter components of it, which do revolve rudiments or, or involve rudiments. So you have a video round first. So everyone will send in a video packet um, digitally. And on there, they'll play rudiments, you know, open, closed, open, slow, fast, slow, however you want to think of it. Um, and then there will be a stock piece that we will send out that everyone has to play that stock piece. And what's happening during that is we're looking for people who have really dug into what the proper interpretation would be to fit our ensemble. So it's not the proper interpretation of how is it exactly to be played, but it's exactly how it should be played within our ensemble. Um, and so we're looking for things like that, little inflections, micro phrases in that, um, in that clip. Uh, and then also there's gonna be a resume that's uploaded and basically a letter of interest uh, for the video round or for that, the, the first screening round. Uh, once the screening, the first screening round is over, we have a live round and the live round actually in, uh, uh, includes a visit to Fort Myer, uh, which is in Virginia. Fort Myer is right across from the Pentagon uh, and it's attached to the backside of Arlington Cemetery. So you have Fort Myer, Arlington Cemetery, um, and then the Pentagon that goes over the wall right there. So, they come to Fort Myer for two days of an audition and they get to see kind of the ceremonial side of our job. Uh, and they see a, a military retirement or an army retirement. And a lot of our job is, is a lot of standing. And you may have a great warm up <laughs> before, before the performance, but typically there's about 10 to 15 minutes of cold standing uh, before we even play one note. And so those notes have still gotta be, they've gotta be as close to perfect as possible. Um, but that's, that's what ends up happening. You go and you see this, um, this ceremony. And then after the ceremony is there, we have a marching round, we have a, a couple playing rounds and then finally an interview. And then we pick our candidate. Candidate. So how many, <laughs> how many new folks are coming into the, how many people are cycling in on a yearly basis? Uh, it's interesting because honestly, it's a mil it's the military. So a lot of folks have to decide first whether or not they're okay with that. Um, cause so that's, it's a big commitment. You have to, you have to honor and serve your country. Um, you have to really be very mature. I think about how you handle, um, yourself professionally because you're serving the commander in chief. And so that's at the end of the day, we have a service to our nation within the military and as a, as a soldier in the United States Army. And so when we're having folks come in, it could be up to 45 tapes that come in or videos that come in. Uh, but typically there is between four to six uh, in-person candidates that come in. And then we usually have about one slot that comes open. And what, what's typically the makeup of uh, this ensemble and the percussion there? What's it typically made up of? How many snares what? and bass yeah. drums? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. So uh, the, the instrumentation of the group is fifes, drums, and bugles, which is not in the name, but we do have single valve uh, bugles that also play with us. Um, the drum section as a whole is uh, 10 snare drums and seven bass drums. And as that cycles through, we never go out there with the entire line. Um, there's a picture behind me here of uh, right before the last inauguration where we had everybody out there. We took a great picture with it. But typically, um, each show is going to have three snares and two bases out there. Okay. So everybody's on probably doing a couple different duties and you have enough right. personnel to cover all of those different things. Yeah, I, I guess we don't really think about um, of course, you know, many of us have done BOA, WGI, DCI, and, you know, we have the eyes, but you guys really have kind of the eyes of the world uh, on you when you guys are on. So that's no pressure, huh? 
<laughs> well, it's, it's exciting. Um, the core itself does about 500 performances annually. Um, and that can be something as small as, um, you know, a bugler playing taps for a funeral all the way to, you know, a huge inauguration parade. Um, but what's exciting even this weekend is we're preparing for Memorial Day. And on Monday, Memorial Day proper, uh, we're going to be out with the, I think it's going to be the first time live military music will be part of the, the a, a government ceremony. So this is, you know, trying to find out what does post COVID-19 look like right now? How can we keep ourselves safe when we were wearing protective masks, how far we need to be from each other to do a live music event. So Monday's a really a big day for us. Um, and we're gonna be at Fort McHenry um, playing actually a flag raising ceremony for the Star Spangled Banner at Fort McHenry where Francis Scott Key was you know, uh, cited to have written the poem and the president and the first lady will be at the ceremony. So we're really excited about it. All right, yeah, so everybody you can, obviously you'll be able to check that out on, uh, on Monday and not only for the, the great sacrifice for those who have uh, given so much for our country, but you may be able to see uh, old Mark Riley in there as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're, you're also bringing, um, and I, I only know a little bit about this. We kind of got, had a little flavor of it about 10 years ago when we were in Europe, um, the Washington tattoo. Can you speak a little bit uh, to this and let us know? So this is another, uh, uh, just another whole different uh, way of looking at rudimental percussion, but it's, uh, but it's certainly relevant and we could, uh, uh, I'm glad what you're doing. So tell us a little bit about the Washington tattoo. Sure, sure. Um, it's a nonprofit for veterans and first responders. So uh, really what it's doing is it's advocating for the arts and advocating that with the power of music and how it does help our veteran population and first responder population. Um, the conversation that's been happening quite a bit is that in Europe, you have a really strong history with the tattoo. And a tattoo is actually a Dutch word called do dun tap toe, which means turn off the taps, the meaning the beer taps. And that was a signal uh, to send all the soldiers back to their beds so they can go to sleep before Reveille came the next morning. So again, if we talk about these calls and these signals that we're talking with the rudiments, you have them also with the fife and the bugle, you have these calls that would signal different things, you know, when to wake up, when to eat. So the term tap toe or tattoo, which it became later on in the English, in the English uh, language, was basically a signal sending all the soldiers to bed. And so that signal later turned into a call, meaning the close of the night and the close of, of business uh, for, that, for that day. So that later turned into a, a celebration. Um, after World War II, the biggest one in the world is the, the Royal Edinburgh Military Tattoo in Scotland. And that really is, that's the juggernaut of the tattoo world. Um, and if you unpack that a little bit, the tattoo scene around the world is a music platform that allows marching groups to stay involved in the activity as long as they can play and march. So there's no age limit. There's no, no, there's no restriction. Um, of course, you want the quality of your performance to be very good. And so you're going to change a little bit of your repertoire. You're going to change a little bit of your programming. And you're not going to be running around the, beat, the, the field at 200 beats per minute um, because, you know, we're all getting old and our joints hurt and we, we, can't, we can't physically do that kind of thing. So could barely do it. Like when... <laughs> right. Um, so you have groups that are these bagpipe groups. You have groups like the Top Secret Drum Corps and things like that that come into play at these tattoos. Um, but it's really a very different scene. It's a platform to make music for your entire life. So I think the idea of comparing a lot of these musical ensembles from you know, WGI and DCI to groups that play in the tattoo circuit, it's not, it's not apples to apples. Um, and that's something I think a lot of people, when you start to look at it, to have the opportunity to play drums throughout your entire life is a massive blessing. And the Europeans really do a great job of taking advantage of that because one of the things we don't really put a lot of stake into or stock into is when your hands start to go or your chops start to go, your ears are still developing and your ears are still maturing. Your ears are gonna mature until the day you pass. 
So you listen to great music, you learn different styles of phrasing, you learn different ways to communicate ideas through your ears, and you have to synthesize it with your brain. And sometimes your hands can't keep up, but you're still, you know what you hear and you know what you want to have happen, which really where your great instructors come from, they have that ability to hear something, synthesize it, vocalize it, and then have the students repeat it. Now, when you become an older performer and you still are keeping your hands or your chops relatively up, you really start to play with a lot of new ideas and where a lot of these tattoos come into play is you get to start to hybrid styles. Um, so a really cool rudimental thing that's happened globally is that the French style, the, the Swiss style, the Basel style, the American style, the British style, these were all kind of very dormant the last handful of years. And because of online learning, they've been figuring out how to hybrid American teaching techniques through drum corps and apply that to their tradition. And so now there's kind of a little bit of a, of a renaissance happening with Norwegian style of rudimental drumming, Dutch style of rudimental drumming, French style of rudimental drumming. And it's starting, you see it on Facebook and you see it with a lot of 19 and maybe 25 year old players where these, these, no one has ever heard of these styles over in the States, but it's, yeah, it's really exciting. So the Washington Tattoo is really trying to synthesize global music using a European model, but then taking American drumming or American music education and trying to weave that together for, for a performance platform. So it's, it, I guess this is a, an experiment. It's going to be a journey and you're right at the beginning and who knows where it's going to finish up, right? Exactly. I, it's exactly it. So yeah, I, I, I've got um, a handful of years left in the old guard until I retire. Um, but really what we're trying to do is we're advocating through the arts, supporting our, our military veterans and first responders and really trying to help arts education globally with a, with a fantastic uh, world-class platform. That's that's great. I, I look forward to seeing where, where this goes and, and we'll have to keep checking back in and, um, that, you know, where can people find out more about that? About the sure, Washington absolutely. Tattoo? absolutely. Uh, so it's the Washington tattoo.com is our website and you can find us on Facebook as well as Instagram. Uh, and we're really, we're just, we're just starting this out now, but we've got an incredible team of folks. Uh, we have some amazing alumni from different military units that are there. Uh, and we're really trying to make sure that we're, we're supporting our folks uh, as much as possible with the online efforts that we have now with COVID-19 and then moving out of COVID-19, how we do things re in real life again with uh, great musical events. Sounds like a, it's a great mission statement that this thing's built off of. Uh, I, I hope it just rockets through the roof. Now, you. You, you talked to... Um, and, like I said, I think we're going to have to come back because there's just too much to unload in one viewing. But you just named, you named Dutch, Norwegian, and like that. Can you take kind of two polar opposites and just discuss a little bit about the difference of some of those? And then hopefully that'll be like a catalyst for folks to then reach out and kind of do their own research and uh, discover on their own. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I, I wrote down some notes uh, just to kind of bounce off of it. And I think the easiest way to categorize how do you approach different styles of drumming is based on beat structure um, and, and the quantification of the beat structure. So when you're talking, let's just say, modern marching percussion today, you're coming up with concepts, you're coming up with drill design, you're coming up with you know, feel and flow of the time of your show. Um, that was not the case necessarily with these traditional styles. And so if you talk about really slow marching tempos, you know, we start talking about one second per beat, or, you know, 60, 60 beats per minute, and we're breaking it down and we do half time and you're at 120, you start looking at how you can break your beat structure down. And so um, a lot of these cultures play marches at different tempos that allow their stylistic nuances to really come through based on the tempo of how they're marching. So if we were to take the, just the, the American classic piece, the Connecticut halftime, I use this in a lot of my workshops to try to understand this concept, because if you take just the first bit of it, you have seven stroke roll, two eighth note flam, seven stroke roll into 16th note paradiddles, 
tap two eighth note flams. Rum, jum, jum, rum, jum, jum, rega, dega, 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 dum, jum, jum. And you could put an eighth note pulse to it if you so choose. Okay, you could also put a quarter note pulse to it if you so choose. You could also put a half note pulse to it if you so choose or a whole note pulse. Um, but to quantify where you want the beats to lie in that phrase, it feels very eighth note driven. And the next phrase after that, you have a lesson 25. And we kind of talked about this um, with another interview that I had done for PAS. Um, but when you get to the, the second phrase, there's a lesson 25. And you can break it down in 16ths, which we've done by putting slashes for diddles inside the 16th note. We've also done it with an eighth note, two grace notes, two 16ths to give it that grace note feel where it's an eighth into two 16ths. But now you have in some interpretation inside of that 16th note. Is it a true 32nd note? Is it kind of slurred a little bit where maybe are you kind of playing around with a little bit of a five lit? Is it, you know, and you, you, have, you have musical choice that you can make. But in a drum line, that's a nightmare because you want everyone to play the exact same thing. So the rudiments based on tempo is one thing. Based on the mission, are you playing in a line of seven or nine snares that have to get everything really clean? Or are you playing in a small ensemble? Like, are you playing in a concert hall where you can really kind of explore where sound takes you in that space? So if you take the next phrase, you have 15 stroke rolls, okay? 15 strokes over three eighth notes, you're breaking it down into a skeleton of seven. Um, you can play it that way to get everything quantified. But if you want the phrasing to happen and maybe we put a little bit of a crescendo into that phrasing, you're starting to think of a half note pulse. And you can start to mess around with the quantizing of is it seven? Is it triplets into sixteenths, which you're making a seven stroke roll into a nine stroke roll? You know, and that's, that's how a lot of these styles start to mess around with the type of rudiments that they choose. So that's an American approach with things that you and I can talk about. Seven stroke rolls, less than 25s, totally. We can, we can speak that vocabulary. But when we start getting into French drumming and we start getting into Swiss drumming, the rudiments start to get shaped very differently when it comes to sometimes they're marching to the quarter note, but really their left foot is just really hitting that half note. And the right foot is just making it happen based on wherever they, they end up marching to. And the reason why is because their whole marching drum, their drum style is based off of a carnival for three days where they played fifes and drums for three days straight and no one's really caring about that right foot so much. They're, they're lifting that drum with their left leg and they just need to march for three days. So <laughs> what's they happening- They can't be bothered. They can't be bothered to put both feet in time. Just take <laughs> care of one. The right will work us out. It'll, it'll follow yeah. me around. Exactly, exactly. But weirdly enough, that gives you a lot of musical liberty with figuring out how your ears and your brain and your hands have a musical conversation because it's not, it's not tied exactly to that right foot, which is, it's mind, it's mind boggling when you first start to see it. But when you start playing with a rudiment called the double is basically inverts. So jet, that jet, that jet, that jet, that jet. And the double came over to the United States in 1969 when the Swiss came over to the deep river muster, which is a thing we can talk about at another point. But the American guys start to learn the Swiss style. And that's where you get the pat -a -fla, That's when you start to get invert sticking. You get the Swiss Army triplets. 1969, that all starts to explode. And you start to see this thing called a double, which is what all Basel drumming marches are really based off of. And it's a swung invert. So instead of jacka 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 jot, you have a downbeat that goes jack, ka 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 jack. And so that's a quantized, almost five lit feel to this double. But if you go to other groups from different areas of Switzerland, they're going to play that maybe with more of a swing. Jack, ka 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 jack, ka
Are you super loose with the swing? Are you super tight with the swing? And these guys are playing these rudimental styles like that, and they've been doing it their entire existence. So very long story short, um, you have these different styles in Norway and France and uh, Finland and, and Switzerland and Italy, and they all have these different vocabularies. But the hardest thing in the world is how do you try to put that into classical musical understanding when you notate it? And that's been honestly my lifelong journey that I've loved. I'm a super nerd. I love this stuff. And that's something I've just do I dove into all the, all these years. But is everybody hearing this? Like, this is amazing to see where all this comes from and how it is. So you talked about uh, kind of the American uh, version of things. Is that why when we, when we're listening to some of the old five stuff, you know, something will be going along right this. And then it just sounds like there's this one role that's just over the bar line and just absolutely like, it's just cut out of something else. And then it picks right back up and it goes into something. And there's just this, you know, sometimes it feels like you're just going along and then there's a, and then it comes right back. Is that, is that what you're thinking inside of all that? Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and this is a great discussion starter with people. Um, when people ask, what is tradition? What, like, where does tradition start? Where does it end? That's this tradition. That's this tradition. You can argue till you're blue in the face on what's right or wrong, but it, tradition starts with an idea and then it ends with an idea. And so people try to put this all together on why in traditional fifing and drumming, why is the seven stroke roll delayed? Technically, it's wrong if we look at it from that point of view. It's not quantified, it's technically wrong, but stylistically, it's been a part of that same thing we talked about with the Boslers. We call it a heavy left. And if the left foot is what really matters in military marching, the right foot is kind of, eh. And we don't really want to say that, but they're carrying a rope drum. It's on a sling. The, the drum is resting on the left leg. If they're marching up a hill, you definitely know that there's probably going to be some delay with that pickup, with that seven stroke roll. And it kind of just oozed itself into the style. And no one's going to say in this book, on this date, this is when the seven stroke roll delayed. Well, no one can research that. It's just, you have to guess and you have to infer on, you know, these guys that were marching on for miles and miles and miles. And so what we've done with the old guard that we've been really something really proud of is that We've been trying to do our homework on those styles and then pick which one of those rudiments could be appropriate in a musical setting with a melodic line that would help build tension. And when can you build that tension with that delay? What rudiment do you choose? Do, do you pick a Swiss one that drives a little bit more or delays a little bit more? You pick an American one and you kind of sew fabric together with these different traditional rudiments. But then at some point you have to decide where is time. And that's when it gets exciting because you have to create, you have to create real time and then you create suspended time and you have to do that musically and hope, hopefully it works and it comes across the way you intend it to. And everybody's got the same silent interp of what that that's where the time is. Yeah, that's where the rehearsals really are exciting and fun because you're going, okay, hey, watch my left hand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to delay this eighth note you know, just ever so slightly. And I need you to watch kind of the conductor's baton. And we would talk about the left stick of the, of the center snare and everyone's peripherally looking in to watch center snares lift to try to match the attack of the left hand roll. No way. So uh, that's just, that concept is probably mind boggling to me. It is to, to viewers, you know, because we live and die by the metronome. Mm -hmm. and just to have yeah. this free well and, and yeah to go to go back to it um my instructor nick used to always complain and again he had been drumming since 1932 he said these guys play beautiful roles they're beautiful but they're late they're late they're late <laughs> and so even the traditional guys sometimes would complain about these late roles but I think, I mean, it's just part of, part of the discussion is in the 1950s, there was a group called the Sons of Liberty. Uh, they were from Brooklyn, New York, and they were led by Les Parks. 
Uh, Les Parks taught Bobby Thompson. Bobby Thompson taught Marty Hurley. Marty Hurley with Phantom Regiment taught, you know, the world. And so, I mean, at this point, you start looking at where some of these traditions, like the left-hand grip, all these are coming from fife and drum things from the 1950s. And a lot of people talk about, you know, Bobby Thompson, Les Parks, but Les Parks went to Juilliard after World War II. And so he was classically trained. He was a jazz drum set player. He apparently filled in, uh, I think he filled in for Buddy Rich and some of the New York scene as like a, a set guy doing certain um, drum, you know, drum set gigs in the city. And he really brought kind of classical traditions to fifing and drumming. And in 1950, 1955, you start seeing this quantification of what it looks like in traditional fife and drum drumming. And the person who really iconicized this was Jack Pratt or John S. Pratt. And so that really, if you start to look into Pratt, there's some books just before Pratt that you can see them arguing, how do you notate these traditions on paper? And none of them agree. And so when you start looking at the books, you're like, ah, I think I know what he meant when he wrote that. But if you take it just on the black and white, it can take you down a rabbit hole that may or may not be true. And that's hard to differentiate. That's awesome. So when you, you're talking about, now we're just kind of rewriting the concept of what is tradition. But let's say in the, in the old guard, um, do you have freedoms to throw in something new, you know, that's come about in the relatively sooner years? Um, what sure. kind of freedoms or constraints do you have? Um, it's based on the mission. So a gig is a mission for us. So every time we do a performance, that's a mission and it comes down in order and we get it from the Colonel and it comes all the way through, through our chain of command. And so, uh, when it comes down to us doing, uh, having more Liberty, we're not going to have that Liberty when it comes into a, a traditional army ceremony, like that's got to be very traditional. That's got to be, um, real, real stock when it comes to like where the downbeats are. And, and so we have to write that way. Um, a, another job that we do is called just a drum detail where we march troops. And so every Monday morning, we have to march soldiers kind of in a parade formation and they're, and the, the colonel kind of comes in and the, the captains come in and that has to be just straight six, eight, rum, ja, jum, rum, ja, and they cannot really deviate from that because the purpose is to just get them marching so they have the old guard style of marching down. But when we go and we do a public relations mission and we go and we play down at the Washington Memorial or the you know, Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, um, or if we're going to Chicago or San Antonio to do an army recruiting mission, we have a lot more play in the, in the, the literature that we're playing. And so um, just for an example, there was a show we did a handful of years ago with the tune, The Minstrel Boy which is an old traditional Irish tune. And the, we were messing around with how do we want to take this traditional tune and like make it 21st century? How do we kind of bring it to life today? And we decided to take it in, in, in an eight bar chunk, break it in four bars and four bars. And we tried to swing the first four and then we tried to quantize the second four. So we kind of played Scottish style to the first four and kind of swung all the rhythms. And then the second four bars, we actually broke it into almost kind of book report, uh, choo-choo kind of things into Swiss drumming. So <laughs> weirdly, and it worked. There were a couple of people that got on there that they put it on Facebook and they were like, I've never heard this before, but it was a huge experiment. Um, and so we put these kind of swung paradiddles, jackadooka, jackadooka, do, jackadooka, jackadooka, do, ba, do, ba, kind of thing for the first four. And then we put these jackadooka, and these kind of counterpoint things in the second four. And to some people's ears, you have to just be aware that, that, that maybe that's too much too soon. And so you have to just kind of be aware of the audience you're playing for. Um, but we took that initial concept and we've been really running with that since about 2005, 2006. And if you hear the stuff we're playing now, you can start to pick out kind of pipe band section, real stock American classic rudimental section. Uh, oh, that's got some Swiss licks in it. That's kind of a Swiss march. And we had to really do our homework on what those traditions are as much as possible, because at some point you do enough scratching at the surface and you get down deep and you pick the scab 
And you're going to find people are like, that's not the tradition. This is the tradition. No, that's not this. That's this. And that's in every art form that we ever have. So we're trying to do the best we can with the research we've done. But I think we've done enough legitimate research that we can stand on our own merits and say, no, we, we, we have. We've done the research. This is why we play this performance practice. And we, we're doing it on purpose. That. That's awesome. <laughs> Obviously, you can't hit them with too many. You can't hit them with too many notes all at once after right. you've laid down a, a line of media, and then you hit them hard. That's awesome. Yeah, and easy. I mean, just for example, if any in, any folks are out there, any educators that are in, interested in doing this stuff, a real simple way to do it is to keep it in eight bar phrases. Do something sixteenth note bass for eight bars. And at the end of that eight bars, think of yourself as a small ensemble or think of yourself as, as a conductor and maybe wait for the pickup of the next eight bars, just ever so slightly. And it's, and it's, and it's really, it's just this, the idea of the up, almost like a breathing in kind of motion. And really at that point, you can start to move and shape musical phrases keeping everyone's head really in the game of the 16th note that they're trying to attack, but you're just changing that, that initial downbeat to watch kind of the conductor's baton. Does everybody got that? Everybody <laughs> got that? You watch one guy, his left hand, there's anticipate. It's just, it just, it sounds like there's a lot of internal feeling into it. And it's, this has been incredible. Mark, I know you're, you're busy. Uh, we've already talked about your daily schedule. You got a whole lot to do. Um, can you tell us real quick, what's, what's one day in my life like? What's, uh, what's a typical day? So COVID, I can't give you a typical day. It's uh, <laughs> survive and try to make all your meetings and get all the information out to everyone. But uh, a non-COVID day um, typically starts uh, 6.15 in the morning. Everyone has to be uh, ready to go. So 6.30 is our, um, our physical training time. So, excuse me, 6.30 to 7.30 is physical training 7.30 to 9 a.m. is getting your uniform prepped and getting ready for your meetings for the day, grabbing breakfast, kind of getting ready. Um, nine o'clock is sectional time. So you have the drum section, you have the fife section, and the bugle section doing an hour of, of their sectional rehearsal. Um, 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock is your first ensemble rehearsal. And so we'll get everybody together for an ensemble rehearsal from 10 to 11. Uh, 11 to 11.30 is what we call new soldier training. So if we have new soldiers that are just coming in, we take that half an hour to bring the group together to get them looking like everyone, sounding like everyone, and just um, having them be a part of the family. 11.30 to 1 is our lunch break. Um, and so we, we're right outside DC, so there's tons of great places to eat and, and, uh, and visit. Uh, but that's typically also where a lot of the meetings will happen if there is individual counseling. So everyone that comes in, you get a mentor and a, a section leader that is there to help you develop inside of your musical training as well as your professional training. Um, so that goes until one. One to two o'clock is usually specific uh, performance or mission rehearsal. So if there's something later on that evening, say it's the small team, which is a 12 person performance, they'll have that specific uh, rehearsal at, at 1300 or 1, 1 p.m. Uh, then two o'clock is our, is our meeting time. So we'll do a command meeting on Thursdays. We have a scheduling meeting on Tuesdays, uh, the different shops that we have. So we have a, a production team that creates all the content. They'll have their meeting at two o'clock, maybe on, on a Wednesday. Um, so everyone that comes in is not just a musician. They're either the public affairs person or the operations person or something else where you have to give them multiple jobs because uh, we actually are self-sustaining. Um, and then to wrap up the day, usually at three o'clock or so, usually you are doing checking emails and kind of wrapping up your stuff until between 4.30 and five o'clock when everyone calls it a day. So most people say there is no such thing as a typical day <laughs> because if you're on a mission and you're, in, you're at the White House, um, there could be rehearsals called in as early as eight o'clock in the morning and you're on the South Lawn of the White House figuring out positioning because the Queen of England's coming in and the Queen has to be in this point because that's the point of honor. And now we have to rewrite the ceremony for this thing to happen. And it's all, it's all happened. You have a structure of a ceremony and then whoever the person is coming to visit, there's always little tidbits of the ceremony that need to be rehearsed because it's changed. And if people go on autopilot and they go left when you're supposed to go right, 
it's going to be on C-SPAN and CNN and Fox News and MSNBC and you don't want to be that guy. So it's got to be as perfect as possible. And that's why you try to have a normal day. Um, but typically there's not a normal day. Sounds like your, your schedule is metaphorical for your, the plane. It's, it's this, <laughs> this, but it's open to enter. <laughs> right. Right. Which keeps it exciting. It keeps it exciting. Sure. And I mean, that's, that's why I love the job I have. Man, that's awesome. So tell me one little thing. I always like to leave these on a fun note. It, if this hadn't been the route that you had gone, um, other than, you know, drumming on the, the lawn of the White House and playing for the president and Queen of England and all these other things, what would you want to do? Um, I have the heart of a music educator. I, both of my degrees are in music education. I was 100% ready to be a band director. That was my goal in life. And I never thought I would ever get a performing job ever. It was a complete um, I was mind boggled and it's, it's an honor to have the job. Um, but I really, I am, I love music education. I love when a little kid gets the sticking of a paradiddle for the first time and the light bulb goes off and they just, they're, they're sucked in and they're hooked. So getting kids hooked on music or getting people hooked on music is a, is a lifelong passion for me. So I would absolutely have loved to, and still would love to be a music educator in a high school or in a college level or something like that. So that. Yeah, I'm very comfortable with that with that answer and that question because I still would do it now. Awesome. Mark, thank you so much for your service to the country. Uh, thank you so much for this history lesson. I, I learned just a plethora. And so I'm definitely looking forward. We're going to have to keep going. We got we to gotta scratch at this scab a little bit more, as you said. <laughs> John, um, I really appreciate so it. And it's, it's an honor to be a part of this program and everything you're doing with um, Apex and Majestic. It's been, it's been incredible to watch the, the organization uh, reach out and service so many incredible musicians and music educators. Well, look, look at who we have on board. You know, like that is, look at, you know, you're an artist and you're just full of it. You're an encyclopedia of history and knowledge. So thank you uh, for being such a wonderful, wonderful ambassador. Uh, so everybody check out uh, the Washington Tattoo, uh, all the other things you got going on up there. Look for you on Monday. Uh, best of luck. Have a great weekend. And thanks, everybody else, to for stopping in uh, for Focus Friday. We look forward to again next week. Join us next week when we have Ralph Nader and Harvey Thompson of BIOS. This show, it should be a fun, fun time. So thank you so much, and have a great weekend. <laughs>